Eu espero que vocês aproveitem bastante a presença do professor Robert aqui e depois possam estabelecer contato, porque a gente vai ter muitos projetos né, para o futuro. E de tarde, então, a aula, por causa do, do alerta meteorológico, a aula ficou é, transferida então, para o YouTube da UFXPA, vai ser online, a aula sobre atenção primária e a pandemia. Né? Mas hoje, então, how to share bad news... Tudo com o professor Robert. Muito e, obrigada. E, e, imagina viajar 20 horas para fazer um evento online. Né? Loucura. Mas é a realidade da nossa situação agora. Posso mudar o microfone aqui? Pode, pode. Vou tirar isso aqui daqui e fica aqui uma coisa mesmo. E eu vou tirar a máscara só para falar. Vou tirar a máscara só para dar a palestra. E outra coisa que tenho que desculpar. Tenho um pouco de tosse. N não é Covid. É asma. <risos> Graças a Deus, é uma doença crônica, não é uma doença aguda. Hein? Mas um, <coughs> eu, eu não quero que assustaram que não tenho máscara e tenho tosse. Hein? Um, e, colegas, obrigado mais uma vez pelo convite, com muito carinho a essa universidade. Para mim, sempre é um prazer para voltar a Porto Alegre. Acho que o desenvolvimento do coração gaúcho. Tristemente, o resto do corpo ainda é americano. Mas, uh, ainda não sabe, não sei bem como como montar carvalho, mas... <risos> e não tenho faca na bota. Um, I was talking to Ayrton about this lecture. And we decided that I would give it in English, only because some of the vocabulary I'm going to use today are words that I don't have very clearly in Portuguese. So just work with me, and I will do my best to make it understandable. I did some translations of the slides, so you'll see some Portuguese on the slides as well. But um, We're going to talk in English this morning, okay? Um, so uh, we're going to talk about bad news. Uh, it's difficult to share bad news with our patients. This is something that does not come naturally to professionals in healthcare. And we have learned that if you train how to do it, it will be easier and more effective. And so I want to talk with you this morning about what we've learned about how to do it, what the evidence is, and some very practical tools that you can bring into your practice with your patients literally tomorrow. Um, hopefully this is not the final discussion on this topic because it's very deep. And I was talking to uh, my friends in the Rectoria here that um, I'd like to come back and do a workshop where we can practice these skills in small groups. And we'll plan to do that. So, como posso passar o ligado? Aqui. Então, vamos começar com uma piada, porque sempre gosto piadas, sabe? A, a guy goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you, you only have three months to live. And the patient says, oh my God, doctor, well, I can't possibly pay your bill in three months. The doctor says, well, okay, you have nine months to live, how's that? You know, doctors can be burus sometimes, you know. We, we really can be burus. And why can we be so crude sometimes, particularly in these very delicate conversations? Because we're uncomfortable. Because we don't know how to do it. And it makes us anxious. It gives us emotions. And so part of the strategy of managing these conversations is to manage your own emotions, identify your own emotions, and 
by doing that, you can neutralize some of your own resistance to it. So here's what I want to do in the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I want to tell you about a clinical case, a made-up false clinical case. I want to talk about a structure to a conversation. And then we'll get into how to share bad news. And then we'll talk about emotions, managing a patient's emotions and managing our own. So the case is this. And are people understanding me? Is, is my language OK? And am I speaking slow enough? I'm good. So the case is this. Uh, the, the news is bad. The news is very bad. Maria is 58 years old. Uh, she has abdominal pain. She comes to you. You find her to be anemic. You do a stool for occult blood. It's positive. You get a CAT scan of the abdomen, and it looks like this. You can see the liver is full of metastases. It's widely metastatic. It's probably a colon cancer based on the imaging. You know that. Now you have to tell Maria about it. She comes to your office another day, and you have to share this information with her. How do you proceed with this very difficult conversation? Okay. And don't answer. Just think about that for a minute. How would you proceed? So far, we haven't talked about how to proceed, but think about what you would normally do in this situation, and then we'll dive deeper into the field here, okay? Before we talk about it, though, let's talk about something that I think is quite difficult to acknowledge, but we need to. This, um, this slide has a classic article uh, published as early as 1982 by Eric Castles in New England Journal. And he talks about suffering in medicine. We need to think about suffering. Because the profession of medicine has two obligations. Number one, treating disease. But number two, managing suffering, reducing suffering wherever we can. These are twin obligations. And don't forget that the care we provide can very often be a source of suffering. We're about to enter this conversation with Maria. We know that she is about to receive very shocking information that can cause suffering. We don't want to have the medical care be another additional source of suffering to Maria. Now, you know, we tend to think of these things as dualities, you know, treating disease and treating suffering, they're separate things, but in fact, patients, families, lay people do not think of them as separate things. They're the same thing. And this idea of, you know, physical suffering versus non-physical suffering from pain as opposed to emotional suffering, this is a false distinction. Um, I had the privilege of talking online with a group here uh, this year about, um, about behavioral health and primary care, and I talked about Descartes, and I talked about the mind and body split, the duality of the mind and the body, and how that's a false division, and our job is to superar, you know, to overcome that division. Well, this is an example of that now. Now, you know, pain when it exists can be a threat to your very existence. Or it can just be pain. Think about childbirth. You know, women go through childbirth, they have enormous pain. And yet they do it again and again and again because it's not suffering. As opposed to a metastatic cancer in a bone where it is a complete threat to the future existence of that person as a person. And remember, people, a person, is the whole of your biological reality, your social reality, and your inner psychic reality. And 
the threat to personhood can be in either of those three domains or in all three together. But when you see a disintegration or a potential threat to your personhood, that's when you suffer. So having discussed that for a few minutes, and there's so much more to say about suffering, we could talk all day about that. I want to talk about structuring a conversation, okay? So let's remember first, this is not social conversation. This is not a random conversation between two people in which you begin with the weather and then you talk about how windy it's going to be and then you know you get on to how are the children and et cetera. This is a very serious matter. And as a professional, you have to be prepared in advance. The worst kinds of serious conversations are the ones that occur spontaneously, almost by accident, when you have to share some news and you're not ready to do it. I'm going to tell you a confession. Sometimes I have things to share with patients. I know what I have to tell them, and I'm not ready to tell it to them. And so I tell them a little bit of a non-truth. I say, I'm going to have important information to share with you at 5 o'clock. Can we get together at 5 o'clock? Even though I know what the CAT scan shows now, I need to do some thinking, some preparing. I'm not ready to have a serious conversation. I will make the time right. I do that frequently, and it's OK. But you know, there's proven essential ways to do this, and the literature helps us uh, because this is a well-studied phenomenon. You know, and sometimes, you know, the patient is receiving terrible news, and you know, the, why me? Why me? And sometimes the answer is, well, why, you know, why not you? Doctor is a Buddha. I have to apologize for some of my cartoons because they're very anti-doctor sometimes, you know. I'm not anti-doctor. So, again, to prepare for the conversation, <coughs> excuse me, the first thing we want to do is to strengthen our relationship with our patient. We want it to be a strong relationship. And, um, Zuman published in, in, in 2020 in the Journal of American Medical Association a very interesting article on the practices, sort of the structure of how we strengthen uh, relationships with our patients. And it involves a series of steps. We prepare with intention, with mental intention for these conversations. We listen very carefully to our patients. We come to some form of agreement on the facts. Because very often, the doctor has one model, the patient has a completely distinct model, and we have to negotiate a shared understanding. We try to make a tight connection with the patient's story. Who is the person with this condition? How, you know, how is it that this condition is now going to impact on this patient's social life, family life, etc. Their personal concerns. And finally, we really have to be ready, prepared to understand the patient's emotions, to take their cues, to absorb their emotions. So if you go into the literature, there was actually a, a, a terrific um, systematic review of how to share bad news in the Journal of the American Medical Association back in 1996. And it's, its structure that emerged from the literature is what really guides us today when we think about teaching about this. And you know, th there's a series of categories which I'm going to explore further, not in detail now, but I'm gonna explore it further. The location of the conversation, who is present, the people, that you'll be talking with, the content of the message, exploring and acknowledging and accepting and absorbing the patient's emotions, you know, allowing enough time so that there's questions, 
at the end, summarizing the conversation so that we all leave the room with at least a common understanding, and then the way in which we speak about it. And I want to go into these points now in greater detail. So let's talk about how we prepare for the conversation. And by the way, um, if you're looking for a good resource on this, you can Google this. There's a group in Wisconsin, in the state of the North Central United States, called the Palliative Care Network of Wisconsin. They have wonderful pocket guides for all components of palliative care, but one of the really good things that they've talked about is this very topic, and I, I refer you to it. I base many of my points here from their work. So, <clears throat> prepare. So first of all, you have to have a place to have this conversation. These are not good conversations to have on the telephone. Sometimes we have no choice, but most of the time, you want to sit down face to face with the patient. So you need a place, and it has to be private, because there may be not only very personal things, there may be a lot of noise, there may be a lot of emotion expressed. You don't want to disturb others, and you don't want to be uncomfortable with the fact that, you know, uh, it's an emotional conversation. So choose a good place. That's why I like to say, I will have information for you at five o'clock, because I know that's when my last patient leaves the clinic, and I can invite them to the clinic, and everybody else goes home, and I have my room with the patient, and we can talk as long as we want, because there's nothing other than dinner, you know, that's waiting for me after that, and we can do what we have to do. Next, make sure you understand the facts. Review the patient's history, review the studies that were done, review the opinions of the other specialists, have all of this available in your head or in little notes that you have ready, and it's probably worth catching up on the medical science behind some of what you're going to be talking about because you at least want to be fluent and correct in the medical science. We're going to get into that in a minute. I want reserve this idea of the medical science in your mind because there's some subtleties to this. And then lastly, be ready yourself. Be ready yourself. Uh, make sure that you understand your own emotional response to what you're about to do so that you can do it with a clear head. And think about it in advance, you know. And by the way, it might be very difficult for you and maybe you'll cry. You know, maybe the patient will cry and you'll cry. I'm going to tell you something. That's okay. It's okay. You know, you're not a robot. You want to be present. You're allowed to have emotions. You just want them to be supportive emotions. Okay. So we, we have this conversation. We sit down. How do we start? How would you start this conversation? I've already asked you to think about this when I presented Maria. So first, take an inventory of everyone who's present. Make sure you know their names. And most of these conversations don't occur doctor and one patient, there's usually a family member or a friend or multiple family members present, and you should allow and encourage that so the patient has support. Next, don't begin speaking until you ask the patient permission to share information. Because Remember, in healthcare, there's a natural hierarchy between doctor and patient. You need to destroy that hierarchy here. You need to make sure everybody's on the same plane. You're not the boss. The patient's the boss, actually. So before you start saying anything, may I talk to you today about something that's difficult? Try that, because when you ask, you'll find a lot of very interesting answers. And some people will look at Well, I'm sorry, God, I really didn't mean to. 
Um, I think the weather is getting bad. Let's see. It's, you know, when, when you ask, um, some people will, will respond to you like you just landed on a, on a flying saucer from Mars, because why are you asking me permission? You're the doctor. That's okay. I just want to make sure that it's okay with you, you know? Other people will recognize that you're trying to equalize the relationship and will respond to that. So, next, ask a question. Another question. Second question. Tell me, please, what you already know about this situation. You know, you could say something simple in the Maria case. You know, Maria, you came to me with this pain and we found some abnormal findings. Uh, we got a cat scan. What's your understanding right now of what you think is going on? Because you're going to need that information. And many times it's not the initial, you know, in, in cancer diagnosis, very often they've already been through multiple other providers and they've heard a lot of things. So ask. Second, and this is really important, I'm coming back to the science. Review very briefly what you know. Short. No technical language or minimize the technical language. You have a lot of science. The patient doesn't want to know science. I'm sorry. You know, some, I guess some, some read on Google and they, they have questions about science. But in this conversation, the patient doesn't need science. The patient doesn't need the results of the last three clinical trials and what the number needed to treat were, et cetera. They just want to know what's going on. So keep it brief and keep it simple in the language of the patient. Okay? Now, one other thing. Before you get into the conversation, before you get to the you know, the science about what's going on. Give the patient a warning. Advertentia. A warning shot. Because this is where the suffering comes in. Before you tell the patient something that's potentially shattering to their life, threatening to them as a person in the social psychological or biological domains, help them take a minute to get themselves ready internally. So it gives the patient and the family a little bit of time to brace themselves. And you can say something very simple. I like this phrase. The information that I have to share with you today is not what I had hoped for. It's not what I had hoped for. We're going to talk about that hope in a minute, okay? Remember that word, it's not what I had hoped for. Because it's a very important use of language in this situation. Or you can say something very simple. The news is not good. And then be quiet for a minute. And then go, you go through your short explanation of what you know. There's really a classic article in the literature written by this guy named Back. It's in the cancer literature from 2005. And he really talks about how to have a difficult conversation in oncology but it's very useful in all fields. And he described a technique that I use all the time, and I would recommend that you practice and learn. And it's called ask, tell, ask. Think about that, okay? Pretty God to get a this. Ask, tell, ask. Because there are certain... <clears throat> behaviors on the part of the doctor that you want to avoid.
Mm, Casa Weber. <laughs> um, there are certain behaviors on the part of health professionals that we want to avoid that actually become natural to us because there are defenses. And those behaviors are blocking. You know, the patient asks us something, we don't answer it, or we change the topic. We don't want to do that. Lecturing. It's very easy for a health professional to lecture. We're all professors. You know, we want to lay out all the facts to the patient, kind of the way a professor would do in an auditorium. Bad idea. Collusion with the patient. Another bad idea. The patient says, well, if I don't ask about prognosis, he won't tell me about prognosis. And then the doctor says, well, if, if the patient's not asking about prognosis, I guess she doesn't need to know about prognosis. This type of collusion is very destructive. And, you know, you don't want to give something that I'll call premature reassurance. Our tendency is we're with a person who's in pain and we want to relieve the pain. We've just told them something really terrible. It looks like you have metastatic cancer throughout your abdomen and the patient has an emotional response. Sometimes it's easier to just say, well, maybe the scan was wrong, I'll show it to somebody else. Or maybe it's not cancer, maybe it's an infection, you know. Pulling back the bad news at that moment is very destructive because you're getting in the way of the patient's ability to adapt to the reality. So ask, tell, ask, ask, you know, what is it that you would most like to know from me today? Something like that. And that really strengthens your relationship with the patient because it first finds out what the patient really wants to know and what they need from you. And then you can answer that question. And then after you answer it, ask again. Ask another question. You know, did the patient really hear what I said? You know, and you can say, tell me, you know, what further information do you need? Or how are you feeling about this now? Or, you know, what did the information we just talked about mean to you? These are open questions that allow the patient to respond. It's different than saying, are you okay? Yes, no answer. As opposed to, tell me more about how you're feeling now, which provokes a dialogue. These are time-consuming conversations. There's no shortcuts. So. The heart of the conversation really is, as I say, lay language, sharing the news slowly, briefly, without technical details, and then be completely ready to repeat everything today, tomorrow, next week, because even though you said it, and even though they acknowledge they heard it, their brain may not be in a position to absorb it. Okay, so we've had this moment. We've shared it. What do you do next? Sit quietly. We're talking animals. It's easy for us to talk, 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 talk. This is a moment where silence is actually your best tool because it's how you will then hear what comes next from the patient and listen very carefully at that moment. And note the kind of emotions that the other people in the room are experiencing. Some of them will be very fierce, anger, screaming, all kinds of terrible, loud emotions. Others will be bland. It'll be surprising in some cases how little reaction people have. You know, the patient might not have experienced this as an existential threat. And that might mean that they don't understand what you said. Or their brain is not in a position to absorb it and react to it. Meaning, you have to be ready to come back to that later. Okay, tool, we've talked about ask, tell, ask. Okay. 
Let's talk about another tool. This is called the, the wish statement. Declaration de desejo, a wish statement. I wish. And um, the, the author here that I'm referring to is a really wonderful internist, Tim Quill from uh, University of Rochester. He published this in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2001. I had hair then, you know, I was just a boy. Um, but Quill, <coughs> Quill is a master at um, teaching about these conversations. And this, I, these, these wish statements are very important because they replace something that's dangerous. What's dangerous? It's really dangerous to say, after you've shared this news, I'm sorry. What's dangerous about I'm sorry? Well, first of all, it redirects the conversation away from the patient's emotions onto your emotions. The patient needs to be the center of the universe always, but especially in this case. So the fact that you're sorry, I mean, you might think that you're showing empathy, but I'm sorry actually can simply be sympathy, or even worse, pity. And if you attended the lecture that I gave on empathy, I think it was two years ago now, here, we talked about the differences between sympathy and empathy and pity. But that's the last thing that the patient needs right now is your pity. I'm sorry you're in this situation. That's not what you want to say. You want to use the word wish. I wish we had more effective treatment to offer you. I wish things had turned out better. I wish the news was better. That way, you're talking about you. I wish. You're showing empathy for the patient. But it's about the patient, not about you. Because these are real expressions of empathy. And, you know, everybody in the room wishes the circumstances were different. Um, but they're useless. These expressions of I wish are useless unless they're followed up by the appropriate exploration of the emotions and the implications of the information. So this one I actually... Uh, I, I used this slide the other day in talking to my wife, who called me from Boston to tell me she had COVID. She's okay. You know, we've had four doses. She has a mild case. But I said, well, now that you have it, you can stop worrying about getting it. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. It's a real Buddha thing to say. And then we laughed about it, you know. But uh, th this is not what you want to do. This is a counterexample. <clears throat> Let's move to the final phase of this discussion by talking about emotions, ours and the patients. Let's begin with the patients. And there's certain generic ways that you can approach um, emotional responses on patients. Uh, you know, psychiatrists practice on this all the time. Those of us in family medicine, other fields of medicine, I think we're more intimidated by emotions. Um, I, I remember an encounter I had with a resident who came to me after talking to a patient about bad news. I said, how did it go? He said, it was a disaster. It was horrible. Why? I made the patient cry. And I looked at him and said, that was the whole idea. I mean, this was a very emotional moment. The patient crying is what, in many ways, you would hope for. It means she's in touch with her emotions. So um, it's hard for us to just sit with someone who is experiencing emotions. And our tendency when somebody is having emotions is to withdraw or to do what I talked about earlier, give false reassurance to calm them down. Don't do any of those things. Think about it in your mind and name the emotion in your, in your mind. I see the patient is crying. I see the patient is angry. I see the patient is anxious. So you've said that to yourself silently. Then you can respond appropriately, you know, and you can 
you can name it for the patient. You can say, I see that this is really hard for you and that it's, it, it's causing a lot of sadness or it's causing a lot of anxiety right now. And you can reflect back that, you know, these emotions are normal and they have meaning. The, it, it's telling us what, what it all means to you and we have to work on that and talk about that. But do not withdraw and do not take back the painful information that you gave. So, in terms of managing emotions and having these very, very charged conversations, there's a certain set of things you don't want to do. These are the no's, okay? First of all, don't do what I'm doing now. Don't talk more than half the time. If you're not listening, if you're not giving space to let the patient and family sit with the information and express, then you're not doing your job. That's lecturing. Second, do not be afraid of silence. You know, we can sit for a while with silence and it's okay. We're taught to be intolerant of silence. I'm repeating it again for emphasis. Don't give premature reassurance. This comes back to science. Don't give scientific facts to respond to emotions. You know, they're crying, they're upset, they're anxious, and you say, well, you know, they're, you know, clinical trials have shown that, you know, we can get 50% of people with this type of leukemia into remission. That's not helpful, but it's easy for you because that's reassuring to you. Maybe I can help, right? But it doesn't help the patient. And don't focus on medical procedures. Because again, very easy place to go. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll refer you to an oncologist. We'll refer you to a surgeon. We'll refer you to a radiation therapist. We have all of these tools. You know, this is a, a time when we have many new types of chemotherapy that might be used. Don't respond with science to emotions. And then, you know, how do we wrap up? How do we end one of these difficult conversations? Well, first of all, make sure that you've left as much time as the patient needs for questions. Don't cut off the conversation. If it's going on way too long, you can say, we have another five or 10 minutes. Let's try to get the rest of the questions now. Otherwise, we'll plan another meeting and we'll continue those, but leave plenty of time for questions. After the questions are answered, give a very brief overview, summary, of what you've just discussed. Because you need to be starting now, before you leave the room, a plan of what comes next. People need to leave the room with this idea that we know where we're going with this, number one. And number two, that you will be there for the patient and the family to support them. You will not abandon them. I can't tell you how important it is that you include that statement in the end of this discussion. I will go through this with you and I will be there for you. I'm a family doctor, I'm not a cardiologist, I'm not an oncologist. We're gonna need those specialists, but whatever else happens, I will be there with you as your guide, as your interpreter, as your support. And then when you're making a plan, check in with the patient again, make sure it's meeting their needs. You know, we'll, we'll have an oncologist see you next week. Is that okay for you? Um, and you know, lastly, it's important then to align other members of your team with this plan that you've organized so that it's not just you that the nurse knows, the social worker knows, your medical assistant knows so that we can all help the patient together. I promised that I'd talk about the word hope. You like to end talks like this with hope. 
And I want to talk to you about another tool. This is a very beautiful tool of language that has as its heart one objective. It puts you and the patient together on one side of the fight and the disease over here on the other side. You always want to be with the patient. Sometimes, for example, patients will come to you asking for the impossible. You know, well, you've told me that this leukemia has come back and, you know, there's very limited options, maybe 5% chance of it working. But I'm going to tell you, doctor, I'm a fighter and I'm a strong person and I am going to beat this. How do you approach that in a patient? Do you want to say to them, well, there's a 95% chance you're not? No. You do not want to be on the side of the disease. So what can you say to somebody who comes with you to you with an unrealistic expectation? You want to support hope. But you want to inject reality into the conversation. And we use these, these two words, hope and worry. Hope and worry. I hope you're one of that 5%. I'm with you 100%. If, if you want to fight this, I'm in there fighting with you. We're going to give it everything we have. I hope it works. You're right. You're strong. I worry that might not be the outcome that we get, and I'd still like to talk with you about what we do if that, if that happens to be the case. You avoid the conspiracy of supporting unrealistic hope, but you don't destroy that hope because it's important. But in so doing, look what you're doing. You're being very humble. You're acknowledging that there's uncertainty in medicine. Miracles happen, you know? Unexpected things occur. We can hope for that. But we also need a plan B. This way we can be honest, but we can also share that hope with the patient. And it's, it's really, it's, it's a wonderful strategy. I want to come back here and practice this with you because these are not words that come easy, but these are things that we do because when patients confront a serious illness, they're like a pendulum. And sometimes they're able to accept the reality of the situation. And sometimes their emotions take them to a place where they deny the reality of the situation and sometimes they're in the middle of knowing that it's bad but not being able to accept it or acknowledge it. And what is normal for human beings in a serious health crisis is to go back and forth. Minutes, days, weeks of hope versus hopelessness, you know, Realistic hopes, less realistic hopes, happens all the time. Don't be surprised by it. Expect it. Finally, finally, our feelings. You can't do this work if you're paralyzed by your own emotions. And this is an emotionally fraught topic. We don't want to be impaired in our ability to engage with the patient at the level that they need us. And there are characteristics about providers, professionals, that make it hard for us. One of them, for example, is to have a very long, deep relationship with that patient. You're really having as much trouble acknowledging this loss as a member of the family. Um, but we also have things that I've alluded to earlier, our discomfort with emotions and our tendency to withdraw and protect ourselves and, um, you know, our, our, our failures to communicate because of that. So it's very important to monitor yourself for signs 
of behavior that's not productive and symptoms of your own emotions. And um, Diane Meyer, who's an incredible palliative care specialist from New York, from Mount Sinai, you know, published this in the JAMA also a long time ago, 2001. But you know, she talked about some of these signs and symptoms, avoiding the patient, you know, avoiding the family, um, you know, being dismissive of the patient's concerns. Um, sometimes excessive contact with the patient can also be a sign of your own emotional dysfunction. And then, you know, there are symptoms. You can be angry. You can be angry with the patient. This lady is eating up far too much of my time. I don't have time for this. I have all these other people in my waiting room. Yeah. It's crazy, but we have these feelings. You know, you can blame yourself. You can blame other people. There, there's a whole range of emotions. I recommend this article by Diane Meyer, and I can leave you all with these references at the end of the talk. You can send them out by email. But, you know, if you anticipate your own feelings in advance, you know, you acknowledge that it's normal. Um, you know, you, you, it, it's especially hard when patients are young, when you have an ex, you know, a deep relationship with them, or when you have an you know, unexpected diagnosis. But it's normal to experience them. You know, it's normal to acknowledge that we have trouble expressing it. If you're a trainee, this is a really good topic to talk with your preceptor about, particularly in advance of one of these conversations and then afterwards as a debrief because you'll learn some of these skills. But there's basically three methods to cope. You know, one is, as I say, name the emotion so you know what you're feeling cognitively. Talk, talk with a colleague, talk with your preceptor talk with a friend. And then a third thing that can really be helpful is just write. Write, write a little personal journal. Th these things can be super helpful. And sometimes, sometimes, you know you're going to have a very difficult conversation. Role play it. Have a little mini drama and ask somebody to play the role of the patient. Practice some of these tools. Ask, tell, ask, worry. You know, wish, worry, things like that. But don't do it like this, you know. So just for the last slide and to sum up, you know, um, I've shared with you today a very practical approach based on literature and science how to conduct these difficult conversations in a way that's effective. You know, what are the goals of these conversations? Well, we want to minimize the patient's feeling of being alone, of being isolated. So we want to be with the patient and maximize their social support. We really want to achieve a common perception with the patient of what the problem is so that we're not talking here and the patient's talking here. We want to address the patient's basic information needs, and I underline the word basic, because that will help us develop a plan. We want to assess and manage the immediate discomfort or suffering of the patient. So if the patient is in pain, we don't want to wait to treat the pain. If the patient's having disabling anxiety, we want to give them something for the anxiety to help them now, you know? Address these immediate sources of discomfort now. You know, we want a, a, a plan for follow-up. And then anticipate what was not discussed. Think back to the situation I talked about a few minutes ago where the patient has a very bland emotional response. You know that that bland emotional response is out of proportion with how much pain and suffering this patient may be experiencing now or in the near future. So it's perfectly legitimate to say to the patient, you know, 
you might have some strong feelings later. And if you do, I'd like you to talk to me about them. I'll be there for you. We can get together again. Because right now I see you're, you're still trying to take it all in and you're not having strong feelings, but they may come up. If they do, it's okay. We can get together. You know, I can be there for you. So just reviewing these tools again, just to cement them in your memory. Ask, tell, ask, because this is the way that you assess how much information the patient already has and what they need. Be very kind in the way that you communicate this bad news. Use this dyad of hope and worry. Identify the emotions cognitively in your mind, the patient's and yours. And then hope for things that are possible. Remember, don't use the word sorry. Use the word I wish. I wish. Or I am hoping. I wish it wasn't so. Or I am, I am hoping for better news. I was hoping for better news. I'm hoping for a good response. And then end with a plan. Because we need to know what's going next. And that's your role as a healthcare provider is to guide the patient in next steps. Last cartoon. What's your health plan? Well, <laughs> it's not to get sick, that's for sure. But um, let's hope, let's hope that the next time you're confronted with someone who in spite of their efforts does get sick, you now have an organized way to approach it that will be less intimidating for you and make you a more effective doctor, nurse, medical student, so that you can really engage the patient in what they need from you in this extremely important moment in their history with the healthcare system. This is, the way I like to say it, I use a a giria in English, a, 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 an idiomatic expression. This is where the rubber hits the road. I feel like when I'm about to have one of these conversations, I've been training my whole life for this. There's probably no more important 30 minutes in my relationship with this patient that I'm about to have right now. So let's get ready and get in there and do it right. I kind of give myself a pep talk, you know, so that I'm ready. Um, but your patients will really respond better if you approach it in something like the way that I've laid out for you today. Thank you again for an invitation here to share some of the themes of humanization dos relações entre médico e paciente, essa, essa, essa tema constante nossa de... de fortalecer nossas relações entre médico e paciente. Vocês não precisaram de um médico de Harvard para viajar aqui a Porto Alegre e dar palestras sobre tensão arterial ou tuberculose ou diabetes. Já tem esses professores aqui que são de muito alto padrão. Mas para mim é um prazer para falar sobre essas ideias que eu passei muitos anos pensando de Integração, integração dos competências como um profissional e um humano. Então, até a próxima vez, que volto para continuar a conversa. E se temos tempo para perguntas, vou ficar até o auditório estar vazio, ok? Obrigado, gente. Obrigado. Let's, why don't we sit over there, if that's good.
Pessoal, quem quiser fazer pergunta, pode fazer em português. Se o Rob não entender, a gente traduz. Okay. Aqui já temos. Aqui já temos. Já temos perguntas? Então. Ah, é, Sérgio, bom dia. Eu só queria perguntar sobre... Por exemplo, eu normalmente tenho o costume de ir no médico sozinho. Eu normalmente não vou com a minha família. No caso, se eu sei que eu vou dar uma notícia ruim para um paciente, eu faço o pedido por telefone, tipo, ah, leva algum acompanhante, isso não ia criar meio que uma ansiedade no paciente, alguma coisa assim? Uh, tem que tomar a pulsa do paciente. Uh, 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 no população que eu sirvo, frequentemente uh, os pacientes vêm juntos com outro membro da família. Essa não é uma coisa estranha, mas uma coisa que pode dizer ao paciente para diminuir a ansiedade é para dizer temos que conduzir uma conversa um pouco complicada. Pode dizer, pode dizer que temos, um, temos que temos que conversar sobre uma coisa bem complexa e talvez é melhor se tem quatro ouvidos na sala para entender melhor, para lembrar o que falamos. Não tem que dizer os resultados no telefone, para dizer, mas pode, pode orientar o paciente que... Se o, as resultados da tomografia será pronto às 5 horas, pode ser uma coisa muito complexa, talvez é mais melhor se vem aqui com sua esposa. Mais, mais fácil se vem aqui com sua, sua, sua filha. Só para hum, ouvir, talvez é mais fácil para conversar com três pessoas. Hum? Talvez... É, tem, tem maneiras para falar assim. A verdade é importante, mas tem uma diferença entre a verdade bruta notícias cruas. Tem uma diferença entre revelar tudo, não dizer nada, hum? silêncio, que é outro problema, e individualizar o informação pela pessoa e sua rede social. Por isso, tem pacientes que vai imediatamente entender essa não pode ser boa. Hum? Uhum. Mas tem outros que não. Tem outros que não. Mas, um, e tem pacientes que têm o desejo de só conversar com você sozinho e eles têm o direito de sua privacidade também. Mas, de minha imaginação, quando quero compartilhar Sempre é mais eficaz se tem mais que uma pessoa. Uhum. Hum? É, eu acho que talvez até sirva como aquela preparação que ele falou, né, de ah, primeiro fazer uma preparação, a notícia que eu tenho não vai ser boa, dessa forma a pessoa já vai se preparando um pouco, né? já traz alguém junto. O, o benefício de ter alguém junto acho que é tão grande que vale até ele ficar um pouquinho né, preocupado antes. Well, uh, how do you manage when the patient is aggressive and it's planning to sue you in this meeting? Uh, o que, que ele faria quando uh, o paciente é agressivo e ele está planejando uh, judicializar a situação? Né? Posso responder a isso em inglês porque é um pouco delicado. Huh? Um, that happens sometimes, where the patient blames you. Você é culpado, doutor, porque você não detectou esse câncer seis meses antes. Huh? First of all, this is where the wish statement helps. I wish I had. 
We all wish I had. That's the first thing. Second, I warned you already about the danger of the word, I'm sorry. But now I want to talk about the power of the word, I'm sorry. Many of us falsely think that when you say, I'm sorry, you're confessing that it's your fault. But in fact, an apology is a very powerful healing tool to reduce some of the emotion in the room where you can say, I'm sorry we didn't get that CAT scan six months ago. Uh, and sometimes we do injure patients. Sometimes we make mistakes. Saying, I'm sorry that that happened to you can help the patient learn to forgive you and at a certain point help resolve this conflict in a way other than going to court. So the power of apology, which actually would make a wonderful follow-up lecture, <laughs> um, is something that you can use in this situation. So this is a place where I would take exception with my warning to not use the word I'm sorry. After using a wish statement, I wish we had. We all wish we had. Uh, we don't, we can, um, we can, we can add our apology. Bobby. We have a question here. Uh, first of all, congratulations, Dr. Janet, for a very comprehensive and humanistic lecture. Um, o que eu queria lhe perguntar, que o senhor apresentou nas melhores condições né, de um ambiente bom, de um consultório adequado, de ter tempo. Né. Infelizmente, muitas bad news precisam ser dadas em situações complicadas. E eu, então, eu queria lhe perguntar sobre dois exemplos. Né. O primeiro exemplo é da pior notícia que se pode dar na vida, que é da morte de alguém. Né? E, e como um médico, em que momento e de que forma, né? muitas vezes numa emergência, enfim, ou numa morte súbita, como, uma, como manejar isso? E a segunda, a segunda pergunta é justamente o que aconteceu nesses últimos dois anos, que era a notícia da Covid, de ter que entubar alguém, né, que é uma péssima notícia, no meio de uma UTI, junto de todo mundo e tal. Então, me ocorre lhe perguntar sobre como dar bad news em situações não ideais. É, é sempre um desafio para compartilhar notícias ruins assim, em uma situação aguda, em uma crise, na metade de uma crise. E comunicação de uma crise é outro tema total, tem outras características, mas os ferramentas que eu compartilhei ainda são úteis na conversação. E a estrutura da conversação atualmente é igual, mas uh, tem diferenças enormes. Um, primeiro... Um, Frequentemente, em uma situação no pronto-socorro, por exemplo, o médico não conhece a família. Totalmente, uh, são estrangeiros, não, não conhecem. A segunda, que não tem tempo para preparar todo mundo. Mas ainda tem tempo para dar uma dessas warning shots. Esse tiro da adventice. Entra a sala... Sente, por favor, me chama Dr. Janet e pode começar. Tenho informação difícil para compartilhar com vocês. Assim, começa. E dá um momento de silêncio para preparar pela informação, para absorver esse golpe que vai chegar. 
e depois pode dizer it's, it's difficult for me to tell you this, but your husband did not survive the resuscitation. I wish I had better news for you. And then you're back on the protocol. Then you're, it's a shortcut into the protocol, but you're back on the protocol because the same things go on, you know, of what do you know about what happened? What can I tell you? You fill in the story with a simple narrative without a lot of scientific detail, and then again, you say, I, I wish I had been able to bring you better news. You know, we make a plan for follow-up. Um, and in this situation, if you're an emergency room doctor, you're not going to say, I'll be there with you, you know, through all of this, but you'll say, who else can I inform who can be there with you? Can I call your family doctor? You know, can I call your cardiologist? Can I, whoever it is, can I call your your rabbi, your priest, you know, whoever it is who will be there for you. Is there anybody else in the family you'd like me to call? So acute crisis communication is a little bit different, but it still follows many of the principles. The problem here is you don't have time to prepare. In the ideal situation that I described, you have time to prepare yourself and the room and the patient. Here you have to do it quickly. What you really want to avoid though is doing something on the telephone if you can help it or being caught in the hallway where you know people can't sit down. You would like and in this situation to have the staff bring the family into a quiet private room not in the hallway so you can conduct this conversation in a dignified way. In terms of COVID and you know, a decision to say move somebody to intensive care, um, the idea that they might need mechanical ventilation and we know that once a COVID patient goes on a ventilator, the probability of coming off that ventilator becomes diminishingly small every day. Um, again, there's not a lot of time to prepare but you can set up the conversation to succeed. You can go to a private place, not stand in the hallway, um, and then you basically need to ask what you can tell the patient. You know, may I share with you what I know? Ask the, patient, ask the family what they already know conduct the conversation very simply, and then end that with, you know, I, I wish I had better news. We are going to do everything we can. I wish it was better. Uh, what other information can I give you right now that will help you understand and prepare for this? You know, but that's, it's, it's really that straightforward. In terms of the protocol, it's very similar. And unfortunately, many of us in this room have gotten a lot of practice at this in the last two years um, and have conducted a lot of these conversations. I had the privilege and duty and sad duty to be responsible for palliative care during the first peak of COVID and had to preside over dozens of deaths myself with my team, my palliative team. And I'm not a palliative specialist, you know. Um, we, we're gonna talk about this later today. But um, we learned on the job. And boy, lessons to take for the rest of our lives. So, thanks for the question. I'd like to thank you for the lecture. It was, as he said, very humanizing and I'd like to ask you, what do you think are the best non-verbal ways of showing empathy and care for the patient? Non-verbal ways of showing empathy? Yeah. Oh, right. fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful question. 
It's very hard with the mask to show empathy in a nonverbal way, you know. Uh, this has really been an impairment to our communication with patients, but the eyes speak very, very loud. Um, so first the room, the room, quiet, big enough so that people can be comfortable, small enough so that we can be close, you know, bring the chairs together if you need to, <coughs> depending on the culture of the, <coughs> of the patient or family get as close as is appropriate for the culture of that person. You know, Europeans like more space. Uh, uh, South Americans like less space. We know this, you know. Uh, I know, I worked uh, with Navajo native peoples. They don't want you to be anywhere near them. You know, they, they want distance. Okay, so you learn these things. Second, eye contact. Open posture. Lean forward, face the patient, and as I talked about earlier, slow speech, simple speech, and silence. I mean, those are your tools for showing empathy in, you know, without using words. But great question, and if you think about that, and again, it doesn't always come natural. Because who, who, you know, who's born learn, learning to do this? We have to practice it. And we'll become better at it. We'll become better clinicians as we practice it more and more over time. Professor, thank you very much for the very richful sharing. My question is related to when we've got to um, we've got to deal with kids or teenagers when they have already um, I think sensibility enough to understand their situation how do you manage to give such a notice to give to share some bad news with them is it is, uh, is there any ver any better protocol you say the truth you say to their parents you talk how do you deal with it when it comes to pediatric you know those are probably the most difficult of all of the difficult conversations that any of us will ever have. Um, and the, the very youth of the patient means that so much you know, potential life is lost, so much potential function is lost over so many years. You know, it's qualitatively different than talking to someone who's already at the end of their life and already made mental plans to, you know, think about the limits of their life, you know. Kids, by their nature, haven't grappled with that yet. They think they're invincible. And so it's triply hard that way. It's hard on us. It's hard on them. And they're not programmed uh, to think about it. And these are the moments when I thank God that I trained in internal medicine, not pediatrics, because... I don't have to do this um, as a regular thing. And I really admire the colleagues that I have who do it well. You know, the pediatric oncologists who do this every single day. And really, I would defer that, you know, the technical questions on how to involve kids at different ages to them. I don't have the same expertise as they do. but. I'll acknowledge that it is world-class difficult, much harder than what I'm talking about today. Thank you very much. Criança com cardiopatia grave e muitas vezes a gente não tem no ambulatório um espaço separado, né, para falar com a criança separado dos pais. Acho que é bem importante primeiro sondar com a família se a criança pode ouvir aquilo ou não. Mas o que eu posso dizer, assim, é que, em geral, as crianças sabem, as crianças têm um conhecimento profundo do que está acontecendo com elas, principalmente em relação ao coração. Então, que talvez outras doenças elas não sintam tanto, né? mas no coração elas sabem que se elas conseguiram correr, não conseguem correr. E, então, mais ou menos, a estrutura é a mesma, só que a gente vai sempre adaptando cada vez mais a linguagem 
para coisas do corpo, para, para saber o que, que elas entenderam, o que, que elas sabem, sempre repetir. Né? Repete para mim o que tu entendeu. Eu uso muito desenho também, mas não é fácil. Realmente, talvez seja a parte mais difícil. Eu acho que o conceito com pediatrics é muito mais focado na parte da esperança e do desejo, a esperança e o medo, porque nós sabemos que You know, pediatric patients, by their nature, are very resilient. And so even with small probabilities of hope, it's really so much more important to support that in, in, in that, in that age group. falar um pouco da experiência, assim, porque às vezes, mesmo depois de uma cirurgia cardíaca super grande, três dias depois a criança está correndo pelo hospital. né? Então, contar isso, que para as crianças não tem tanto também... Uh, essa questão mais eu não sei explicar mas elas têm elas estão mais tranquilas né para e já aconteceu da gente ter criança que estava em coma no outro dia acordar já pedindo sorvete né então uh, eu acho que elas têm um, um componente assim de mais confiança que é isso daqui a pouco já não estão mais com o sofrimento do sofrimento né que, é, que a gente conversa bastante mas não é fácil, tem que sempre ter muita sensibilidade, porque às vezes a família não quer contar para a criança, tem que respeitar, mas ao mesmo tempo tentar falar para eles que a criança precisa saber alguma parte né, do, do que está acontecendo, porque você também não pode submeter uma criança a uma série de procedimentos sem que ela saiba o que está acontecendo. Então, é, a nossa tendência é cada vez mais é, que a criança saiba, compartilhar cada vez mais, e elas têm muita capacidade de entender. Nesse caso especificamente, o paciente é a, a criança ou o adolescente ou é, são os responsáveis quando você quando vem nesse sharing bad news? É, a pediatria tem essa relação bem complicada. O paciente é a criança, mas os pais são os responsáveis. Então, a gente não pode fazer nada que os pais não queiram, a não ser em situações de emergência. Por exemplo, que seja tem aquela situação... É, tem aquela situação em que os pais não querem que transfunda, mas a criança precisa da transfusão, daí a gente precisa de uma autorização especial para fazer. É, outra, é outro capítulo mesmo. né Mas, geralmente, é, é a unidade familiar. né Então, a gente não pode fazer nada que os pais não autorizem, embora a gente possa conversar com eles para para dizer, olha, o melhor seria isso, essa é a minha opinião. Mesmo que seja dar uma notícia. Isso passa antes pelos pais e uhum, mesmo que o teu paciente é, o ideal, seja a pessoazinha que está ali. O ideal é conversar com eles antes. Não sei se mais alguém, se o Flávio concorda. Eu queria também fazer uma pergunta. Quem, quem aqui é do primeiro ano? We have lots of first year uh, first year students. E eu acho que a gente tem muito uma tendência, quando a gente está no comecinho do curso, a achar que a gente vai ter que se fechar né, emocionalmente, vai ter que ficar duro, né, porque não vai poder sentir essa emoção todo o tempo todo. E não é fácil mesmo. Mas eu queria ver se o Rob podia comentar um pouco sobre... Uh, you, you've talked about acknowledging our emotions, and we still feel these emotions, still have it. like sure. 30, 40 years after graduation. So, um, How do you manage? Well, you don't have to shield yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. E eu já dizia, às vezes eu choro. Às vezes eu choro. E é totalmente, atualmente, posso lembrar vários eventos assim em que eu chorei. Acho que quando eu poderia expressar meus próprios emoções durante esse encontro, fortaleceu nossa vínculo. Uh, e foi óbvio pelo paciente que as emoções que elas experienciaram são legítimas, porque eu também tenho a mesma. Um, e não tenho vergonha disso. Tem médicos que têm vergonha de chorar à frente dos seus pacientes. Não? Voltam para a guarda-roupa para chorar depois da, cons da consulta, etc. Não é necessário. Pode. E não, não tem que dizer, desculpa, estou chorando, não. Estou chorando porque eu também sinto muito essa emoção que temos aqui, a tristeza dessa situação. E a esperança que foi melhor. Mas é legítimo. Outra palavra, 
another word that I wished I had used in the presentation is resilience. It, I'm thinking about it now. But as we build in our patients the capacity to absorb this difficult news, we're actually supporting their resilience. And as we learn techniques for how to share it ourselves and how to manage our own emotions, we're building our resilience. Um, I gave a talk here not too long ago on burnout. And burnout really is the result of overload from all of these demands that exceed our sense of competency. Well, we're trying now today to build some more tools of competency for you to reduce the tendency to develop burnout and anger and depression among healthcare providers themselves. Uh, we need to be strong for our patients. And this is one way we can do it. You know, if you're gonna be in a fight, you know, you could punch and punch and punch and get punched back and everybody can be wounded. Or you can do judo and you can pass the blows by you, you know, and this is a way that it's the same fight, but you don't leave it wounded. And these techniques are ways to do that in a, what is really a very, very difficult fight. But you want to leave the fight intact. And that's, that's a goal. Rob, I'm so sorry. Now it's my turn to give bad news. I wish we could have much more time to stay, <laughs> but but the students they they have another they have another course that which that should start at ten. And, I apologize. And they they need to leave now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to say that, <laughs> but I wish we could stay. I wish I wish we, I could, wish we stay could stay longer. longer. <laughs> exactly. It was very 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 nice to have you here, Rob. And Thank please, you. he will be with us at five o'clock, right? Online. Thank you so much. Even if even if not a doctor, I many of your tips here we can trans we can use for our work relations for the students right in our relation Jennifer. in the education so thank you so much thank you understanding oh yes uh, rob told us that we will soon sign our uh, memorandum of understanding with harvard medical school so this is very good news for our university <laughs>